And now, an eighth special presentation. In this edition of Artbeat Nation, meet an artist turning tin cans into works of art and acts of human kindness. The more I cook and feed, the more material I have to make canned art, the more I can sell to buy more food to feed more people, to buy more cans to get more money to feed more people. <laughs> a female scribe who is writing herself into the history books. The Torah that Julie is writing for us will be the second Torah ever written by a woman. And discover how paper, utensils, and nature make art. How can I make that into a paper cut? You know, how can I make that two-dimensional? It's all ahead on this edition of Art Beat Nation. Funding for Art Beat Nation is made possible by contributions to eight from viewers like you. Thank you. Arizona artist Alexi de Villiers constructs sculptures, robots, and other fun creatures out of recycled tin cans. The tin cans he uses for his projects come from ingredients in meals he cooks up every week, which he then donates to elderly homeless in Phoenix. De Villiers proves that one man's trash is indeed another man's treasure. I like to cook and I like to do art. I like to make my robots. I, I think people need to eat above all. I mean, it's, it's the main thing in life. You have to eat. And I feed elderly homeless people in downtown Phoenix. They're heavy. They're about a pound and a half each. To be able to feed the elderly homeless, I use the cans that the food comes in to make sculptures. I make dogs, sharks, and robots, and uh, cats, airplanes. These cans have a story behind them. Every single one of them either fed an elderly homeless person or a battered woman at the shelter. The more I cook and feed, the more material I have to make can art, the more I can sell to buy more food to feed more people, to buy more cans to get more money to feed more people. <laughs> My name's Alexi de Villiers. I'm a recycle artist. That's a leg, that's a leg, and then that's an arm, and that's an arm. People have called my style of artwork uh, steampunk, but I never knew what that was until just recently. And I always thought it was just can art or recycled art is what I would, can, you know, recycle art, because now I'm into just everything. And the material I, I get is all junk or trash or just leftover things. I, I, I see it and I say, oh, I can make something with that. Well, I have no formal training if you, except if you'd call um, junior high shop class, high school shop class, formal training. I learned how to weld, learn how to cut wood, measure wood, use screws, use tools, sanders, drills, bores, everything, grinders. And now I, the tools I use is self-tapping screws and a drill and a pair of tin snips are the main two tools that I use. One Halloween I said let me make a couple funny things and put in the yard. This is an old DMV eye checkup thing. Uh, that's a toaster. The end that's his mouth in there and just some teeth and those are those Freon tanks and then the golf clubs as feet. Uh, a lot of my art is literally functional. I make toilet paper holders and all sorts of different functional things, and this is literally a functional sawfish. And then I just started to make them you know, get smaller and smaller and smaller until I had all the leftover cans all piled up, and I just put a few together and said, oh, it looks like a robot. I cut the can in half, and then it fits right on there with four points. I put a screw and a screw, and then a screw and a screw, and it looks like a little foot and a leg. And then about a year in, you know, they're all stacked in the yard. My wife says, why don't you sell some of these? So then that's where it all started. Robot sale! <laughs> <laughs> these are working lunch boxes. I attach heads and feet to them. You can put your lunch in it. And all you gotta do is make them do like a little push up and you can have your lunch. And you can hang, you can put your cell phone in his hand or you can put your iPad there. And then I've got, I use the, a lot of Cabbage Patch dolls. I find a lot of dolls at the Goodwills and things, and I use the Barbies. I find, I think that the coffee pots and the tea kettles are the funniest. 
That's just an upside down tea kettle. And I make the lamps. Uh, these are track lighting. The head is a track light and the, the fixture is mounted on the inside. So I just disassemble it and load it on top. And I buy wiring and switches. Toilet paper holder. Put your roll of toilet paper, put your air freshener. And some are just funny. I make the heads move. Maybe I'll make this one a sad face. So if you're not feeling good one day, you can just turn it around. Growing up as a kid in uh, Florida, Miami, Florida, my mother had five kids and um, one paycheck. So my mother had to stretch the paycheck a lot, but I remember how much love went into making the food and how delicious it was. And there was always plenty, you know, cause she would start out with dried beans, dried rice, and she'd go get a nice giant cut of meat and cut it herself. And there was always a lot of food for a little bit of money. So my wife and I, after a bunch of years, we moved out here and then I got a job with the state of Arizona at the Veterans Home with the Department of Defense cooking food for the retired, uh, retired uh, colonels and sergeants and stuff like that. And they taught me how to cook in large portions and how to make it small so they don't really need a knife. So I, that kind of spilled over into the cooking now for the elderly. We saw how many homeless people there are just right here in the park down the street from us. So uh, one day we thought, let's go buy some frozen meals and put them in the oven and take it over to them. And it came out to like $55 for 40 little frozen meals. So I said, you know what? I can do this much better and much cheaper. So the next week I went and bought rice, black beans, and a big old leg of pork, a Cuban tradition. And I cooked it up and I was able to make 70 meals with $50 worth of stuff. So the next week I bought, I made, I bought enough food out of my own pocket to make 120 meals, but this time, instead of going to the streets, I just went straight to the shelter. So as soon as I got there at 1030, they were all lined up ready. So I just started to pass out the meals. And four years later, we've been just doing the shelter, the, the elderly shelter. Um, I just, it's, it's fulfilling to see these people that don't have anything. They're older and the streets are tough. My future plan is, I wanna get one of those empty buildings downtown there and turn it into a kitchen that works Saturday and Sundays. Plus I wanna hire veterans coming over now. So I wanna show them, you know, I'll teach them to cook, teach them to do things like that. I'm sure they know everything, but I know you drove a tank there. Here, no one will give you a job shoveling sand, but here's, let's cook, watch, everyone eats. I like to cook and I like to do art. I like to make my robots. So I can keep cooking and keep making art and it just keeps going in a circle. These cans have a story behind them. Every single one of them came from tragedy, but then it, it's trying to alleviate some of the tragedy in these people's lives. So, you know, they get away from their abusive husband at the, at the shelter, they have a nice hot meal, those cans come to me, and then I feed elderly people that don't have anything. So when you buy it, now you have a good story. This is Winston. You like Winston? I love Winston. I okay. Want to buy it. All right. He's all yours. We'll just take this and okay. go on my way. Great. Thank you. Thank you very much. <laughs> awesome. To learn more, visit Fish Lips on Facebook. Andrea Martin, a biologist, uses her science skills to bring nature to life on paper. She enjoys the challenge of taking complex objects from the environment and transforming them into paper cuts. I tell stories by cutting designs in paper with a, an X-Acto knife. My name is Andrea Martin and I'm a paper cutter. I've been drawing all my life. I love drawing and I really like uh, representational art and I like the very graphic nature of the black and white, but I also really like the challenge of looking at something and saying, well, how can I make that into a paper cut? You know, how can I make that two-dimensional 
you know, how can I show something without color? Um, you have to kind of trick the eye into seeing something that's not really there. I want the fox to look like he's hidden behind these leaves. And I think I can do that by making hatch marks to show his fur. And that'll make the leaves um, stand out and look like he's behind it. The piece that I'm currently working on is a piece for the Roseville Library. I was asked to do a paper cut of a garden that would show the different um, plants and animals that are found in their garden at the library. I spent a long time researching what um, plants and animals were native to Minnesota. For example, what kind of rabbits live um, in Minnesota? What kind of grasshoppers was I seeing? So in some ways I wish I could just cut a grasshopper you know, without doing the research, but I actually enjoy that part as much as I do the paper cutting. When I first went to college, I had to decide between being a biology major or an art major, and I chose biology. I'm really glad that I did take the biology classes. It taught me observation. You know, it taught me to see the world a little bit differently, and I think um, that this shows up in my paper cutting. It shows up in the details. Um, um, I love the details in, in my work. I had my own scientific illustration business, so I drew graphs and I drew um, pictures of animals and things like that in pen and ink. Um, then I became a teacher, uh, taught science um, for many years, <laughs> always incorporating art somehow into the work I was doing with the kids in science. It's really important as a scientist to observe. I do a lot of daily walking and I look at the animals and plants and how they're interacting with each other. I look for sources of water for animals. I look at patterns in nature. Patterns in nature um, really fascinate me. And so if I'm out and I see a leaf that has been eaten by a Japanese beetle, um, I look at that and say, oh, that's a paper cut. I mean, it's it's a beautiful. Um, people don't like Japanese beetles. They're invasive species, but they actually make beautiful leaf paper cuts. The paper cutting that I do, I think, have some messages sort of hidden in them. I mean, I'm interested in putting a smile on people's faces, but I'm also interested um, in people getting messages about how the environment is affecting the animals. Um, I did a piece called View from the Other Side, and it shows a woodpecker all by itself in dead trees. In the background, you can see the city. I was thinking about uh, loss of habitat for animals when cities are built and expand, especially. Um, and what animals would survive and what wouldn't. My next paper cut, I'm interested in doing something along the lines of um, global warming. And so I'm planning images and things that will be on this paper, but also looking at color in my work too and how I can use that to an advantage, you know, to get my message across better. I also like just pretty pictures. <laughs> to learn more, visit andreamartin.com. Next, we head to San Francisco, California's Contemporary Jewish Museum, where Julie Seltzer, a female scribe, is breaking ground by writing out an entire Torah, a sacred Jewish text. Being a woman in this traditionally male-dominated field, Seltzer continues to make history, one ancient letter at a time. Paro, 
v'shilachet b'nei Yisrael me'artzo. You shall repeat all that I command you, and your brother Aaron shall speak to Pharaoh to let the Israelites depart from his land. I generally say or sing or chant a prayer or a line to get in a ready state and a focused state um, with, with the right intention. Julie Seltzer is a soferet, or scribe, performing a tradition that has been passed down for thousands of years. A feather quill, bottle of ink, and 62 sheets of parchment are all she needs to create a sacred Torah. A scroll uh, of the Torah uh, is probably the oldest continuous document that humanity has. And the Torah scroll, that is the handwritten scroll of the five books of Moses, uh, represents God's wisdom and what human beings need to know in order to be human beings. For someone to take on the sacred, holy responsibility of writing a Torah uh, is an extraordinary commitment. I don't think of joy and hard work as being separated. It's also an opportunity to be more quiet in a world that often feels very rushed and loud and overwhelming. The, the scribe uh, is governed by elaborate rules for how the scribe would copy a Torah, including the number of letters in each book and the number of paragraphs and the number of columns. And they're all checked and double checked to make sure that the Torah that we read in the synagogue today is to the best of human capabilities, flawless and exactly like the one God, according to legend, gave Moses on Mount Sinai that was written in black fire on white fire. So this is one of my favorite letters, the letter Pei. While it's a Pei with the black ink, in the, the formation of the letter, what you see on the inside in the, the white space is actually another Hebrew letter, it's the bet. I read the words and then I say them and then I write them. It helps the scribe to not make errors. Though she is following centuries old scribal rules, Julie is actually breaking with tradition in two ways. She is a woman in a field dominated by male scribes. And instead of a scribe's customary solitude, Julie is writing her Torah in public view at the Contemporary Jewish Museum. According to traditional Jewish law, only a Torah that's written by an adult Jewish male will be kosher for use. So this is why women haven't historically been scribes. Barred from traditional scribal schools because of her gender, Julie looked online and found a teacher willing to train a woman. The Torah that Julie is writing for us will be the second Torah ever written by a woman. 20 years ago, it was not common to find very many female rabbis. And things have really changed and progressed. And so I'm hoping in 20 years, it will not be unusual to have a female scribe. For Julie, being commissioned to write a Torah was a dream come true but performing a spiritual act in public is proving a bit of a challenge. I don't know of any other museum who's really over a year period had somebody, in a sense, on view doing their work. There are artists who, as part of a performance piece, their work includes people and interaction, but not something that's trying to produce something that then will be sacred and used. So we really have been struggling with how to balance the interest of our visitors with the needs of Julie as she writes the Torah. When she first started, visitors used to come right up to Julie to peer over her shoulder. Now her space is cordoned off, and a live video projection offers a voyeuristic view of her hand at work. Regularly scheduled breaks allow visitors the chance to ask their most burning questions. I'm just wondering, I, I'm sure there are times when there are mistakes made, and I'm just curious about how you how you fix those mistakes. Thank you for recognizing that certainly there would be mistakes. The biggest myth is that a scribe can't make any mistakes, and if you make a mistake, you have to start the whole Torah over, which I think is kind of a remarkable um, myth, simply because people actually believe it, which is amazing. Because something is holy, it doesn't mean that you necessarily want to stay away from it, because holiness is also about coming close to something. So. For me, that's what's 
amazing um, to be able to share that process. I get to be very close to the Torah as I'm, as I'm writing it, and um, people as they watch can also be part of that, that process. Before she became a scribe, Julie was a baker for a Jewish retreat center. She would often shape ritual breads into her favorite scenes from the Torah. I've made everything from a scene of people getting swallowed up by the earth. It was a giant mound challah ripped apart with little people flailing about to ritual objects. And this year is based on scribal oddities or interesting things connected to a scribe's work. So it's usually words or other things connected to how Torah is written. As part of her residency at the museum, Julie is combining her dual passions for baking and scribal arts by conducting food for thought workshops for visitors. So we're going to be making hamantashen, but that's not um, the only thing that we're going to be doing. We're going to be talking about um, the holiday of Purim. After studying a passage from the Torah, the class gathers in the museum's kitchen to make baked goods related to that portion of the text. I love doing baking workshops and sessions because it's a way for people to connect with Torah with an easier entryway than the text. And everyone gets to participate and everyone gets to learn through doing. Taking time to interact with the public has its rewards, but at this point, Julie's beginning to feel the pressure of completing the Torah. She's about a third of the way through and must finish by December. At the rate of one column a day, the work is painstaking and precise. Kind of like if you're going to run a marathon, you have the training schedule, and if you follow the schedule, you'll be ready to run the marathon. So I have my Torah schedule, and if I write the amount that I need to write every day, then I'll complete it on time, God willing. Right around the corner from Julie's desk, visitors can lift a cloth to see a few of the sheets completed so far. Eventually, they will be bound together into one scroll and offered to a community in need of a Torah. One of the great things about um, learning about the Torah is that they're always done anonymously. So there's only 304,805 letters. It does not allow you to sign your name to the Torah. We'll be sending this Torah out in the world to be used, and eventually no one will even know that Julie wrote this Torah because it will just be one of the Torahs being used by a congregation somewhere who will really um, read it and use it as a sacred object, and who wrote it is not important, but it will have a new life as a living document. To learn more, visit the website of the Contemporary Jewish Museum at thecjm.org. I think documentary allows a photographer to insert themselves into the work. It really gives you a window into the mind of the photographer and like it's a little bit of their spirit is in the work and you can feel it when you look at the images. I love photographing anything regarding people's secrets or anything where something that's not readily apparent to people, I like bringing that out in the open through my photography. And the Pandora Project was through something that I had myself, which was uh, a little treasure box where I kept all my, you know, mementos and photographs and things from my past. I started discovering that almost everybody has one of these things, or at least some sort of container where they keep their old relics from their past. I had them label the significance of each of the items on the print itself. And I would also take a portrait of them with their box to kind of connect the, the face with the, with the items in the box. I think just that process of meeting people and getting to know people's stories is the best part of photography for me. For more arts and culture, visit azpbs.org artbeat, where you'll find feature videos and information on the Arizona art scene. Funding for Artbeat Nation was made possible by contributions to aid from viewers like you. Thank you.